During the early 1920s, the world was mesmerized by King Tut. A British archaeologist, Howard Carter, discovered the young pharaoh's tomb in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, 1922. But the public wasn't only interested in gold and jewelry. The press wrote about the curse of the pharaohs. But was it true? Was an ancient curse really the reason everyone entering the pyramids lost their lives? At the time, this was the only explanation for a series of unexplained passings. The man present at the opening of King Tut's burial chamber, George Herbert V, Earl of Carnarvon, lived only five more months after the discovery. He had also sponsored the dig. In comes Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You probably know of him, the English writer behind Sherlock Holmes. He claimed that an evil elemental caused the explorer's demise. He must have been joking, right? Unfortunately, no. The newspapers continued to blame the pharaoh's curse after every Egyptologist left this world. These are the scientists who study the ancient cultures of Egypt. The archaeologist who opened King Tutankhamun's tomb passed away full 17 years after the discovery. The reason for it wasn't a secret, Hodgkin's disease. Yet again, journalists around the world wrote of a curse. This was getting ridiculous. But science must have had a rational explanation, right? Well, it did. And that explanation was common mold. Harmful fungi, Aspergillus, can survive for ages in sealed tombs. When humans inhale them, there's a high risk of infection in people who have a weakened immune system. Today, doctors believe this is what happened to the unfortunate explorer more than a century ago. Scientists now know that this type of fungi grows especially well on grain. And King Tut's tomb was full of offerings in the form of baskets full of raw grain and bread. Researchers discovered other varieties of fungi on ancient Egyptian mummies. These molds can easily cause some nasty consequences for humans. The danger of rotting organic material is real. Just look inside your fridge. Any food leftovers you have there start to go off after just three to four days. You can imagine what happens to food in a sealed chamber after thousands of years. Food is just one kind of organic material. There is also wood. If you expose it to water or even moisture in the air, it starts to deteriorate. You don't have to travel to Egypt to see the effects of this process. Any abandoned building in your neighborhood can serve as an example. When a piece of wood gets wet and has no way of drying out, there is going to be damage. From fungi to wood-boring insects, the list is long. Rotten wood presents a huge structural issue. Beams and floor panels are all made of timber, so you better not go inside a failing building. You can easily lose your footing. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. The building materials since the time of the pharaohs have changed, but so have the dangers. One of the best examples is asbestos. Until the 1970s, most home insulation materials contained this substance. It was in everything, from boilers to soundproofing. This microfiber provided excellent heat insulation. But then, the United States banned asbestos in 1989. The UK did the same a decade later. The reason for it is that asbestos becomes a health hazard when it gets damaged. When humans inhale asbestos fibers, they can get seriously sick. Abandoned strictures are full of this material, and there is no one to maintain them. You see the danger now. Another material is also common in old buildings, lead. Ancient Romans used lead piping to channel spring water into their homes. They also cooked in lead vessels, which was probably not the wisest of choices. You see, lead and water don't go well together because of something called corrosion. But this problem isn't ancient. US officials banned lead piping only in 1986. That means that 7% of American households still have lead service lines. And this is not the only source of poisoning. Until the mid-1960s, builders used lead paint to coat woodwork. In abandoned buildings, this lead coating snapped a long time ago. Anyone who touches doors and windows will disturb this lead dust and inhale it. The dust particles are at least visible to an unaided eye. This is not the case for carbon monoxide. This gas has no color, so you can't see it. It has no odor, so you can't smell it. No way to detect a carbon monoxide leak at all. And how does this dangerous gas usually escape? Poor maintenance. Well, abandoned buildings have zero maintenance. One second, you could be exploring an old factory, and the next you could feel dizzy with and have a terrible headache. These are just some of the symptoms of CO poisoning, the less severe ones. But what is the source? 
All it takes is for an old boiler to finally give way after years of neglect. We've reached an important question. What is the main factor in air quality inside a room? If you are thinking the level of oxygen, try again. It turns out that oxygen levels drop by only 0.3% in 8 hours inside an airtight room. This is a room in which doors and windows are sealed with tape. So, the decrease is even smaller in normal conditions. Oxygen isn't the main problem. The levels of carbon dioxide rise sharply inside a sealed room. This is the direct result of human breathing. We inhale oxygen and exhale CO2. Think of it as a waste gas. Normally it's only a tiny portion of the air we breathe 0.04%. But in a sealed room, high levels of carbon dioxide will make you feel drowsy. And that's the last thing you need when inside a dilapidated building. Carbon dioxide will decrease your ability to think clearly. Researchers from Harvard did an interesting study in 2016. They had office workers come in six days in a row to complete a problem-solving test. During the week, they gradually raised the carbon dioxide levels in the mock-up office. The results of the same test kept getting worse over time. There are many factors at play, but CO2 levels definitely had an impact on the workers' problem-solving ability. The test took place inside a typical office environment, not inside a crumbling building where visitors must watch their every step. When I say visitors, I really mean trespassers. And trespassing is a criminal offense in the United States. This goes both for private and public property. If you defy the law, you can be fined up to $5,000 or even face lockup time. That should make you think twice before jumping over a fence with a no trespassing sign. But again, you might not be the only one inside. You can never know who else is in the building. Perhaps a person up to no good? It doesn't have to be a person at all. Animals can pose a threat as well. You would be startled if you saw a rat, for example. But the poor animal would be scared as well. It might bite you. The list of diseases rats carry is pretty long. But rodents' teeth can cause other forms of damage. They grow constantly, so the animal has to constantly nibble on something to stop them from overgrowing. If you ever felt peckish at 1 a.m., you know the feeling. Electric cables are high on the rodent's menu. Abandoned buildings have plenty of those. Old wiring is dangerous on its own. Structures erected before 1984 often used wires made out of aluminum. Today, copper is the standard because an aluminum wire is 55 times more likely to catch on fire than a copper one. Flipping a switch in a rundown building can cost you your life. Be on alert for telltale signs that something is wrong. Lights that flicker, sparks from sockets, and the smell of smoke. And yeah, don't count on an earth cable to protect you from electrocution. Ground cables became standard only in the 1960s. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery, so there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings, except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. 
so there was no way to hang it in the past. Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know, the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only open the doors once a day before people enter the temple to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. 
scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around one volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit… uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes, get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable, running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. This just in, the world's oldest pyramid was built during the last ice age. And I'm not even talking about Egypt. I'm saying our ancestors might have spewed a 27,000-year-old pyramid in West Java. Ganung Padang is not exactly shouting pyramid. It's more of a mound with huge scattered stones tossed all over it. But local people seem to revere it, and they have for centuries. It wasn't until recently that the Indonesian authorities decided to excavate a bit deeper to see what all the fuss was about. They ended up finding the remains of a human settlement. It was rather unexpected, since the mound is pretty high up. This excavation could only prove there were humans in the area as far back as 45 BCE, which sounds reasonable. It was up to an Indonesian geologist named Donnie Hillman to prove that Ganung Padang is the world's first pyramid. He used all sorts of new technology to support his claim. Our guy used carbon dating, which digs deep into the earth and takes whole chunks of soil. He found layers and layers of constructions, like he was digging up Rome and finding ancient buildings buried in the ground. His research proved that there had been caverns and even rooms down there, which could only mean one thing – humans. As for the rocks located up in the mound, they were most likely strategically placed by the people who lived there back in the day. They needed a place to meditate, so they arranged things in a harmonious way. Their smooth surfaces wouldn't be the result of years of erosion, but the works of great sculptures, the Michelangelos of their day, let's say. If this is all for real, then human civilizations began way, way before we think they did. Our ancestors, the Paleolithic humans, didn't have what it took to be considered a civilization especially not the tools and knowledge to build pyramids. They needed a lot of masonry skills, which weren't all that available during the last ice age. His peers don't share this view, though. They could believe Hillman's theory if he had found evidence such as charcoal and bone fragments, but he didn't. Flint Dibble, another archaeologist, says that without concrete evidence of human activity, there's no proof of an actual pyramid. In this case, all the data proves is that the soil in the mound dates back to 27,000 years ago. He thinks the rocks on top of the mound just slip down the hill, like rocks normally do. Only a complex society would have managed to build a stepped pyramid like they claim it was. But according to Bill Farley, an American archaeologist, there's just no reason to believe there were any settlements in Indonesia during the last ice age. Now, just so you know, the oldest known ancient society with this kind of knowledge is probably 11,000 years old, 
and used to occupy the region of modern-day Turkey. Take a look, Turkey's Gobekli Tepe. It's also not a pyramid, but it's the oldest monolithic construction made by humans. Back in the Neolithic period, a lot of people settled there, and there are proofs for it. For example, the walls there are covered in ancient drawings of clothing and wild animals. Until recently, the title of the world's oldest pyramid went to a three-sided construction known as the Djoser Pyramid in Egypt. Djoser is located just a few miles south of the Giza complex in a town called Saqqara. It made its way to popular culture more than once. In the 18th century, it became a common feature in European paintings. Young men from the cultural elite did a grand tour around the world, and Saqqara was at the top of their list. It was also featured in the video game Assassin's Creed, with a digital representation way more accurate than many historical drawings of the thing. That was kind of a big deal in ancient Egypt, to build pyramids for kings to spend their afterlives. And if you thought the Khufu pyramid was the oldest one in the world, well, Djoser was built 70 years ahead of that time. The development of new technology has allowed archaeologists to make groundbreaking discoveries, and a new, or should I say ancient, pyramid in South America might win the title in dispute. It turns out that pyramids were also pretty fashionable in the Americas in the old days. Among them are the iconic pyramids of Guatemala's Tikal Temple Complex, the same ones that appeared in Star Wars No. 4. But to find the oldest pyramid in the Americas, one would have to travel to Peru. Deep in the Peruvian desert, archaeologists stumbled upon a sprawling ancient metropolis known as Corral. At first, researchers believed that the settlement was pretty recent, since the site was way too complex for ancient technology to handle it. As we said, Corral is a desert town, like Las Vegas, but without all the hoopla. This means no easy access to water. And for cities like these to thrive, they need a considerable irrigation system, which leads us back to complex technologies. The Peruvians surprised us all with this new discovery. This site was huge, filled with an amphitheater, houses, and religious buildings. The whole thing probably sprawled through 370 acres. And when scientists went to test their initial hypothesis using radiocarbon dating, they found that the city probably sprung around 2027 BCE. On the site, archaeologists found six pyramids that could possibly predate the one in Saqqara. As far as they know, both civilizations coexisted in the same time period, in opposite parts of the world. But since researchers can't pinpoint the exact age of Corral's pyramids, it's pretty hard to guess which civilization completed their pyramid first. Hmm, if only we had a crystal ball. Now, it just so happens that the shape of a pyramid is something that nature is able to produce all on its own, leaving us modern-day humans a bit confused. A classic example is the Japanese side of Yaonagani, which also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis. The entire monument is about the size of five football fields and the height of a five-story building. Explorers and scientists believe that Yanagani dates back to 10,000 years ago. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Mizaki Kumura, Yanagani is the heritage of a lost civilization. Kumura has dived into exploring the ruins over a hundred times over the past 10 years. To him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. Check out this triangular-shaped pool on the monument's surface. Kimura thinks it's actual proof of humans, because this triangle-shaped concave is a historical symbol of water fountains in the region. As it happens with a lot of these cases, not all scientists are convinced the same. For many, Yonagani is probably the result of thousands of years of erosion. And the fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe it is not really human-made. Sure, these huge basalt columns may look like the ruins of a palace, but they're most likely the result of the intense volcanic activity in the region. And speaking of natural formations that really look like a human made it, a pyramid on Mars has been a hot topic lately. Humans have been keenly trying to prove that there is life on Mars for quite some time. But some are stretching it really far, saying that little green or gray people built a pyramid on the planet to try and build their own civilization. This picture was taken over a decade ago by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the MRO. But it started to resurface recently. It shows what looks like a three-sided pyramid. 
Some people claim that the smooth side of the pyramid could only be the effect of otherworldly work. Mm. Then, science comes along and explains that Mars is home to one of the deepest canyon systems in the whole solar system. The so-called pyramid is located in what is known as the Kandor Chasma region. This Martian region has a bunch of similar formations that are nothing more than the result of erosion. Nothing supernatural going on there, apparently. The story goes that two Mayan twin boys loved to play ball. Sure, they were really good at it, but they also made a lot of noise when playing. The lords of the underworld soon became bothered by the sound and summoned the two boys to the underworld, a place the Mayans called Xibalba. As soon as the boys reached their gloomy destination, the lords of the underworld began putting them through a series of tests. Soon enough, the inexperienced twin boys failed the tests and lost their lives. But this was not in vain. This sad event resulted in the appearance of a beautiful fruit tree. Soon enough, a young woman saw a beautiful fruit on this tree and reached up to pick it. Legend has it that soon after that, she gave birth to another set of twin boys named Hunapu and Jibalanqui. Just like their ancestors, these twins were great ball players, But they were equally as loud, and the lords of the underworld became annoyed again. They decided to ask this pair of twins to come to play a game in the underworld, hoping to get rid of them, too. When the twins arrived, the lord sent them through a number of frightening places. The first one was the House of Gloom, which was very dark. They then passed through the House of Knives, where they had to avoid getting injured. The twins then built a fire in the House of Cold, so that they didn't freeze, and ran through the House of Jaguars, where they tricked the animals into not eating them. Finally, they entered the House of Bats, where they seemed to have lost their luck. One of the bats managed to run off with Hunapu's head. The lords then challenged the twins to play ball with them, but the boys were clearly at a disadvantage. Jibalanqui placed a turtle on Hunapu's shoulders to make up for his lost head, and they began playing. As the lords became distracted by an animal near the court, Jibalanqui stole his brother's head and placed it back in its place. Much to the annoyance of the lords, the twins were now able to tie the game. Hunapu and Jibalanqui continued to perform a series of tricks for the lords of the underworld. One of them involved Jibalanqui injuring Hunapu and then bringing him back to life. The lords were so impressed by the twins' performance that they asked them to do the same trick on them. Of course, the twins agreed, but after performing their trick on some of the lords, they refused to revive them. Seeing what had happened, the lords of the underworld admitted defeat and begged for their lives, promising not to intervene in the lives of people ever again. Hunapu and Jibalakwi were happy to have avenged their ancestors and gained the respect of the lords. Legend has it that the lords of heaven were so impressed by the twins that they took them to live in the sky by turning them into the moon and the sun. The Maya civilization was one of the most dominant indigenous societies in history, and their folklore and traditions are still discovered and studied today. They used to live in a territory called Mesoamerica. It was made up of modern-day Mexico and parts of Central America like Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, Yucatan Peninsula, and El Salvador. They lived from 1800 to 900 BCE and up to 900 to 1500 CE. Apart from their impressive legends, the Maya were very skilled inventors. They're known for their calendars, writing systems, farming methods, and sports. Their writing, for example, was found preserved on buildings and stone monuments, as well as in rare books and pottery. It's a system made out of more than 800 hieroglyphics in various combinations. Each of those signs was said to represent a syllable. Their writing system was deciphered by accident by Tatyana Proskuryakov, an American woman who initially studied to be an architect. Since she didn't find a job in her field, she eventually became a Mayanist in her own right, despite not being academically trained. She was the first to notice that the Mayan upended frog glyph meant birth and that their toothache glyph meant the date when the king ascended to the throne. 
it made it easier for scientists to pinpoint birthdays as well as the names of the rulers of a specific Mayan dynasty. They also invented the concept of zero, which is seen as one of the greatest innovations in mathematics, physics, and human history altogether. Sure, even back then, people understood the idea of having nothing, but the concept of zero as a number is a relatively new invention. A fun fact about Mayans is that they really liked hats. The bigger your hat was, the more important you looked. Not only was it a sort of fashion statement, but it also made them look taller, which was a big deal for their aesthetic. The Mayans also came up with one of the most intricate and complex calendars in human history. It was the first to use zero as a placeholder. Their calendar ended on December 21st, 2012, which led some people to believe that it translated to the end of the world. Obviously, that was not the case. It just so happened that the date coincided with the end of a Mayan cycle of years. But you know, as advanced in science and astronomy as they were, they did make some mistakes. One of them was their belief that the world was flat. Their theory was that the four corners of the world were watched by the brother lords, who kept the sky from falling over their lands. Hats off for their menus, though, as they were well-known chocolate eaters. They turned eating chocolate into a form of art. The drink they made wasn't really like the hot chocolate we enjoy today, though. The recipe included mixing cacao with water, honey, chili pepper, cornmeal, and other ingredients to make a foamy, spicy drink. The ritual of drinking cacao was a crucial part of their celebrations. We're not done discovering all the amazing parts of their architecture and civilization. It was only a few years ago that a Maya pyramid was found at Tonina, in the Mexican state of Chiapas. It was estimated to be more than a thousand years old. The reason why it escaped archaeologists for so long was that it lay hidden under what was believed to be a natural hill. The ruins of two Mayan cities have been recently discovered in the Mexican state of Campeche. Why didn't we find them until now? Well, they were concealed by really thick vegetation, which made it difficult for archaeologists to reach them. The Mayans didn't just disappear. Their descendants are still around today, many of them choosing to live in their ancestral homelands. You can find them in Guatemala, for example, where the Maya people make up the majority of the population. Overall, the Maya ethnic group contains people that speak different Mayan languages, such as Yucatec, Quiche, Quechi, or Mopan. They had no idea what a spa day was, but the Mayans really enjoyed a nice sweat once in a while. Sweat lodges were discovered around ancient Mayan sites. They were built out of stone or adobe. These rooms were an essential part of their cleansing and healthcare rituals. One of the earliest sweat lodges was found in Quello in northern Belize and appeared to date back 3,000 years. One of the most important parts of the Mayan culture was a ball game which they named Pips. It had both political and spiritual significance. We can see ball courts at important parts of Mayan archaeological sites. The main goal of the game was to pass a rubber ball through a very high stone hoop without using your hands. Basically, it was a combination of soccer and basketball. However, it could have serious consequences. The loser could, at times, even lose his own life. Ooh, high stakes indeed! Because of this game and the need for bouncy balls, the Mayan people were some of the first cultures to use rubber. They made it using natural latex. There were different kinds of rubber depending on what natural substances the latex was mixed with. And that, my friend, is the way the ball bounces. Sorry, but you know me, I just couldn't resist. Imagine working seven days a week on a large-scale construction site. You, along with thousands of others, carry millions of stone blocks and put them on top of each other according to a complex system. You work without modern construction equipment. You have no air conditioning or constant access to water. It's so hot outside that you can fry eggs on the road. You've been building the pyramid for decades. And now, when it's finally done, you enjoy the result of the colossal work of thousands of people. 
You're looking at a giant cultural monument of global value that will freeze in time and amaze people for tens of thousands of years. A few thousand years have passed. People in the 21st century see the pyramids and are like, wow, I can't believe humans have built this. Yeah, the people who built the pyramids wouldn't have appreciated such a theory. But actually, there are reasons to believe that people built it using some fantastic technology. From the outside, it seems the Great Pyramids are just big triangles of stone. People just put some heavy blocks on top of each other, and that's it. In fact, the design seems too perfect to be true. The pyramid consists of more than two million blocks. They lay so close to each other and are so even that you couldn't squeeze even a thin sheet of paper between them. Scientists still can't figure out the exact technology for building the Egyptian pyramids. One of the biggest and most famous is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This huge construction, well known all over the world, has one big secret. There should be a capstone on top of the pyramid. It's a triangular shaped stone block, a small pyramid on top of a huge one. It's also called a pyramidion. The builders of ancient Egypt made it out of granite and limestone and covered it with gold. No records or old drawings prove that there was a pyramidion at the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. But there's another ancient Egyptian structure with such a triangle, the Red Pyramid. It was built before the Great One, and its capstone has survived to this day. Archaeologists have found and reconstructed it. But where could the capstone of the Great Pyramid be? It's a mystery that still has no answer. Some are sure that some thieves have stolen it from the top. Maybe they just climbed up and pushed the Pyramidian down. It makes perfect sense. The capstone was probably the most valuable element of the pyramid. Many scientists and archaeologists still don't know its exact purpose. Some believe that this peak covered with gold glorified the pharaohs. The capstone reflected moonlight at night and illuminated the entire space around it. During the day, the capstone reflected sunlight with its shiny surface. You could have noticed it from afar. The top of the pyramid was a kind of guiding star for lost travelers. All other stone blocks of the pyramid consist of limestone. People polish them to make them look shiny. In the past, they were even glowing and reflected light. You could see glowing pyramids from space, although they looked like tiny lights. Over thousands of years, winds, sandstorms, and rains have changed the pyramid's appearance. If people had taken care of them all this time, they would have looked like something out of science fiction movies or the pyramids from Las Vegas. But unfortunately, we will never see their original appearance. Some archaeologists and scientists believe that the capstone could absorb the sun's energy and distribute it evenly throughout the pyramid. No one knows precisely why the Egyptians needed this technology. There's a theory the pyramids are ancient energy systems. The pharaohs applied this energy to use some unique technologies that were more advanced than all the achievements of the 21st century. And the triangular shape of the pyramids was ideal for boosting this electromagnetic energy. In theory, solar radiation, or electromagnetic forces, accumulated at the top of the pyramid, filled the inner rooms, and then went down the walls to the base. Any surface distortion could prevent the flow from spreading, so they had to create a perfectly smooth surface. That's why they installed the blocks so that nobody could squeeze a needle or razor blade between them. Many people believe in this theory because they built the pyramids from limestone. This material can hold energy inside itself. In the inner part, they created granite deposits to cause air ionization, that is, to create an electric charge. They also dug channels under the pyramid for water to transmit electricity. And at the top, they put a gold capstone, the best conductor of electricity. So this is how you get a great power generator. Different cultures used similar technologies to create electricity all over the world. But these are all theories. If it had been working, 
humanity would have used these technologies today. There are mentions of the metal industry, chemistry, engineering, physics, mathematics, and astronomy in some ancient records. Most scientists don't believe in all these things. We know the detailed stages of the technology's development in different cultures. In the 21st century, scientists, historians, and anthropologists can track the evolution of all modern devices. If people had created some technological inventions in ancient times, the history of the world would have looked different. Perhaps all the achievements of antiquity could have been wiped off the face of the earth by global cataclysms. And it can happen to us. Just imagine how people would dig up a laptop in 5,000 years. Perhaps they wouldn't understand what kind of device it is. Another Egyptian wonder surrounded by mystery is the statue of the Sphinx. The Egyptians carved it out of a single massive piece of limestone about 4.5 thousand years ago. But scientists still don't know the exact date of its construction or who built it. People painted the Sphinx in different colors, so it looked much brighter and more vivid in the distant past. It was shining just like the Great Pyramids. Anyway, time hasn't only changed its appearance, but its name too. Initially, the Egyptians called it Horemeket. The Greeks renamed it the Sphinx about a few hundred years after it had been built. The Sphinx emphasized the greatness of the rulers of Egypt. It also performed a symbolic function of a watchdog guarding the tomb of the pharaoh and the paths leading to it. This version sounds realistic, since archaeologists have discovered many secret entrances at the foot of the Sphinx. Perhaps these rooms and intricate tunnels lead to underground halls with treasures. And treasures don't always mean gold and jewelry. According to legends and theories, the Sphinx guards the Hall of Records, the storage of all humankind's knowledge. The information about the ancient mythical state of Atlantis could be there. You can find many detailed maps of the internal dungeons of the Sphinx on the internet. They show structures 12 stories deep under the statue. It looks like a small city filled with gold, scrolls of knowledge, and various ancient artifacts. But don't believe all these maps. These are just theories. Several thousand years have passed, but people have very little information about it. Archaeologists know that there are still many strange and exciting things about the Sphinx that are still undiscovered. Some locals are afraid to research because they believe they can awaken something terrible from the underground depths. Therefore, it's mostly scientists from other countries who conduct the excavations. In 1998, scientists discovered strange tunnels leading to empty rooms under the Sphinx. They realized that some people tried to get there through tunnels in the past. And maybe those people took all the treasures that were there. One of the legends says that some powerful artifact lays beneath the Sphinx. Its technology can change the whole world, but the locals are hiding it because it can damage the planet. Some believe that you can find evidence of unknown technologies painted on the granite walls in the pharaoh's tombs. But most likely, these paintings and signs tell us the myths and legends of ancient Egypt. But what if Egyptian symbols and drawings are detailed instructions for using ancient technologies? What if the locals that lived at that time thought, hmm, people in the future won't be able to get energy themselves? Let's leave some detailed instructions for them. Anyway, there are many riddles and theories. In reality, the search for answers is a dangerous undertaking, since it's not easy to get into the underground halls. Excavations can ruin the structure of the entire Sphinx. Any person inside the tunnels may get lost and never be able to find their way back. Besides, it costs a lot of money. Now what would be awesome is if people could invent some device that could scan underground areas and show their detailed models.